And now I'm honored to, uh, to introduce you to our uh, speaker for tonight. Uh, he is a Davis alum. Uh, his name is Tony Perkins. And he is a pioneering media entrepreneur. Uh, he's a prominent opinion leader in uh, technology business. And he uh, has a very prominent role in the, uh, in the editorial world, largely, you know, largely defined. He's really a Silicon Valley icon. Um, and he was really at the, at, the, at the very beginning of the internet as a business. Uh, Tony founded Red Herring Magazine in 1993. I remember when this was the read. And if you want to know what was going on in Silicon Valley, that was, uh, that was the magazine. Uh, everybody who was inter interested in the internet economy uh, read Red Herring. In uh, 1999, uh, Tony wrote a book called The Internet Bubble. This was a best-selling book uh, that, that foretold the, uh, the dot bomb. Uh, and that the bubble would burst. He, right after this was published, he came to the Graduate School of Management to talk about, uh, to talk about this book. And I will say that he was largely seen as, um, as uh, I'm sorry, the right Drunken word is. Drunken sailor. But, <laughs> what did you say? I said <laughs> drunken sailor. Drunken sailor, no, no. That uh, Tony was, uh, was seen as a very wise uh, visionary for understanding the dynamics of the, of the uh, technology uh, uh, business economy. Uh, he is now the editor-in-chief of the Always On Network, uh, which uh, he founded in 2002. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go to alwayson.com. Uh, um, it is a very popular web community for people in high tech, uh, and, it's, and it's really a leader in the open media uh, revolution. Always on focuses on those sectors of the, uh, the economy or of technology markets that where really exciting things are happening. And it's, a, it's always on is the platform from which Tony uh, launches a series of, of very successful uh, media, digital media, entertainment, finance, and technology summits that, that bring together um, uh, the scientists, the, uh, the entrepreneurs, uh, the, the finance uh, community together in one space at one time. And it's uh, truly, truly exciting to, uh, to be part of it. Uh, last, uh, last September, Tony brought uh, Always On's first Going Green Summit to UC Davis. It was truly, uh, it was truly uh, 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 exciting to, to be part of it. And, uh, uh, and Tony is planning another, another Going Green. Um, Tony is a volunteer, not only volunteering to, uh, to talk to us tonight, but he, he is the uh, chair of Silicon Valley's uh, premier business and technology forum, the uh, Churchill Club in Palo Alto. Uh, he's uh, served on President George Bush's, George W. Bush's uh, Information Technology <laughs> Advisory Council, important. Um, uh. So he's a public... Uh, <laughs> no. Thanks, Gene. <laughs> Sorry, uh, and uh, and I think we will move now to Tony's talk tonight. <laughs> uh, Tony will take uh, he will take some uh, some questions at the end. Uh, you've already welcomed Tony Perkins. Well, great. Uh, s s glad to be here. Uh, Dean said, hey, we got 150 people showing up. It's a big hit uh, for you. And now I realize why you're here. You had free dinner. Uh, so so uh, I'm going to talk uh, a lot. There's a common theme out there called open. And I'm just going to play a little bit of, I think, a movie, uh, an old song that came out in the 70s to kind of get you all geared up. <laughs>
revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by Xerox and four parts without commercial interruption. The revolution will not show you pictures of Nixon blowing a bugle and leading a charge by John Mitchell, General Abrams, and Spiro Agnew to eat hog moths confiscated from a Harlem sanctuary. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by the shape of a war theater and will not star Natalie Woods and Steve McQueen or Bullwinkle and Julia. The revolution will not give your mouth sex appeal. The revolution will not get rid of the nub. The revolution will not make you look five pounds thinner because the revolution will not be televised, brother. There will be no pictures of you and Willie Mae pushing that shopping cart down the block on the dead run or trying to slide that color TV into a stolen ambulance. NBC will not be able to predict the winner at 8.32 on the court from 29 districts. The revolution will not be televised. Okay, I, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I know it's a political year, and you've already uh, learned of my uh, political persuasion. For that, I apologize. Uh, that was brought up tonight. Um, but seriously, um, uh, I want to tell you a, a little story. This, you know, and again, I'm going to further alienate you, but this is a, a picture of William F. Buckley, uh, who actually uh, just died, just passed away uh, a little a couple months ago. And uh, this is a picture, uh, for those of you who don't know him, he founded a, a magazine called National Review. Uh, he's the founder of the conservative movement of sorts uh, in America. Uh, he's written over you know, hundreds of books, uh, bestseller novels, uh, had a television program on NPR or public uh, television called Firing Line for years. Uh, he was really the guy who um, helped, you know, create the, the, the opportunity for Ronald Reagan to become President of the United States. And the reason that I'm even bringing him up is because back when I was going, when I was probably roughly around your all age, I think I was 28 years old, uh, I was going through a midlife crisis. Uh, and I had had the great fortune of uh, having a, uh, the first job out of UC Davis. Uh, and I, and I want to uh, tell you a, a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, I only wear a suit for funerals and the dean. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I've never taken a business class uh, in my life. And this is probably the 20-something business school I've spoken to. So I get great pleasure out of that. Uh, when I was at UC Davis, uh, I think I was always just one step of getting caught by the administration. Um, I was holding sit-ins in the uh, uh, for against apartheid uh, and whatnot. I was heavily involved in the green movement. Uh, I bought a greenhouse uh, at Village uh, Homes when I was 20 years old. Um, so in spite of you know, the imagery that you might have of me from the beginning of this show, I'm just, you know, kind of softening you up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really a radical, uh, and I'll prove, I'll prove that, and I really am a liberal, so uh, you'll, you'll learn that uh, if you get to know me. But what was happening is I had worked on a, uh, well, I was Jerry Brown's student campaign manager, uh, back when he was running for re-election, and I actually held uh, like a 2,000-person rally in, at a Davis Park and brought the entire Democratic slate to Davis uh, the day before election, uh, uh, believe it or not, and that's part of the reason I was always one step ahead of the law, uh, because I don't think I got the proper permits. Um, but that being said, so I had a political background, but then I ended up getting a political appointment to a startup bank, believe it or not, called Silicon Valley Bank. And Silicon Valley Bank has since come to dominate <laughs> the venture-backed uh, company business. They have about 80% of the market. So I was very blessed to, at 23 years old, uh, get a position there. And I was there from when they opened the door. I brought in a deposit for $2 million that pushed the bank's assets up 10% uh, to $20 million. It's now an $8 billion bank. Uh, and I was a co-founder at 23 of the technology group. But even in spite of that, having a lot of fun helping 
start that bank uh, and create it and, and put it on the map, uh, I wasn't quite satisfied uh, with what I was doing. And so I had this opportunity to pick up Bill Buckley uh, at the airport uh, because by then I had uh, kind of evolved to the dark side. Uh, and I had a great time and we were driving to the back of this limousine uh, down 101 through Silicon Valley and he kept marveling at all the Silicon Valley startups that he could see up and down uh, the highway. And of course, for a conservative, a free market conservative, uh, this was a complete petri dish uh, that proved you know, the vibrancy, viability, and beauty uh, of a pure free market system with no unions, uh, stock sharing, uh, all the great things that gave birth to Silicon Valley. So at the end of the limousine ride, <coughs> he says to me, he goes, wow, you know, and, I, and I had been all very nervous about uh, spending that much time with him, uh, but interestingly, true to his intellect, rather than dictating things to me, he just kept asking me more and more questions really about Silicon Valley. And so at the end of which he goes, you know, this is just really fascinating uh, and really is a great example of how jobs are created, how wealth is created, how innovation uh, drives uh, the top of our economy. Is there a, a magazine or a publication that I can subscribe to so that I can keep up uh, with uh, this, this phenomenon? And I said, you know, I thought about it. And I go, well, there's the San Jose Mercury business section. I go, but I, I really couldn't think of a publication. And then as he's getting out of the limo, and, or, or as I'm getting out and he's driving off, he said, ah, so perhaps we've thought of an idea for a new Silicon Valley startup. And so what happened is six months later, uh, I published my first magazine. <coughs> and it was then uh, called Upside. And I told the story of uh, you know, how uh, the idea was born. I was my own CEO. Uh, I was in charge of my own company. Uh, and I, was, I had arrived. I had solved my, my early midlife crisis. And I just was looking back. When Bill Buckley passed away, I looked back at the first issue. And this was the first company profile we did, which was on a little startup company that was born out of a venture capitalist office. And on the way over, uh, I looked up on Yahoo, the market cap for Gilead Sciences. And today, it's $46 billion. So what that proves is as editor, I know how to pick them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I have since, and, and I think because I, I've really been able to live the dream uh, that I've, I've, I've tracked as a journalist, uh, which is a beautiful thing. I've, I've, I've followed lots of great companies uh, like Gilead and seen them, <coughs> even just more recently at Always On, uh, we had introduced a, a kid out of Estonia named uh, Nicholas uh, Zenstrom, who uh, is now famous billionaire who founded Skype, as an example, uh, the first kind of American coming out of, of Nicholas was uh, at our Stanford conference, uh, and, and he uh, showed up. Uh, YouTube was another, Chad Hurley, uh, they were in business about six months, and we picked them uh, as the up and coming company of the year, because uh, we could see at that time that video was going to be a big thing. Uh, on the internet. <clears throat> so given that I've been a student of the world, both as an entrepreneur, and I, and I would say if you were to ask me, you know, what, what am I first, I would say that I, I would have to say I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur first. Um, you know, as Dean mentioned, I write often for the Wall Street Journal editorial page, and I write for my own publications, and I give a lot of talks like this, but at the end of the day, you know, I am very uh, passionate about entrepreneurship, uh, and I believe, uh, and this is the Catholic boy in me, that you know, supporting the entrepreneur is a great thing because it's the entrepreneur that creates the jobs, wealth, uh, and raises the level uh, of, of uh, uh, living standard for us all. And so unlike some people that have different political persuasions than I do, um, I like to reward the entrepreneur. You know, I like to uh, support them, and I don't look at entrepreneurs cynically. Uh, I don't think that when they, 
you know, earn a billion dollars of net worth, that they're taking that billion uh, from anybody. They've created that billion. And underneath them, you know, most of us work. Uh, so that's been my passion. So the good news today, because I have very good news, <clears throat> is that in all my career, so I've been kind of on the streets of Silicon Valley for 25 years now, either lending money or writing about it. Uh, I would say very simply uh, that this is the greatest time to be an entrepreneur. I have never, ever, ever uh, seen so much excitement, so many new and cool uh, things to do. So I'm going to talk about why I'm so excited about uh, the market. Now, <clears throat> to illustrate this, you've all been kind of looking with qu uh, questionable eyes at this chart. But basically, uh, this chart is a, is a picture that kind of illustrates why I think it's a great time to be particularly an internet entrepreneur. Now, I have been trying to get people to coin this great curve uh, as the Perkins curve. You know, you have Moore's Law, you have Metcalf's Law, you know, and, you know, and, and, and sometimes I get a little momentum on this, and then when they realize that there's absolutely no statistical data behind this curve, <laughs> then that, <laughs> that, that I just made it up, uh, then it kind of blows my uh, attempt. Um, but anyway, what I, what I was trying to simply say here, and this is something, I think it's a really important business lesson, in spite of the fact I've never taken a business class, it, which says that when, whenever you have a new innovation, okay, you really have no customer base, you have, it's, it's expensive to create because you're creating it for the first time, you don't really know uh, how people are going to embrace it or use it. And so it's actually at the beginning of the curve is the worst time to, to try to enter that marketplace, okay? And we've seen that over and over again, whether it was the beginning of electricity or the automobile or, you know, the television set or the telephone. At the beginning of a new booming commercial innovation, uh, is all, it, 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 you get all of this rush to, to come in and take advantage of it. And uh, we as Americans, which is God bless us, we overfund it, okay? And that hence created the, what we saw as the internet bubble uh, back in the 90s. And it was just because we were pouring all this money into a marketplace that didn't exist and we didn't really know what it was about, okay? And that's why when I wrote my book, Internet Bubble, in spite of the fact I was publishing 650 page magazines. I mean, I use one today as my doorstop in my office. It was so big. I mean, Vogue was jealous in those days of red herring. Okay? And uh, I was a history major in part, and it was through my historical perspective that I could see that we were repeating history. Because again, every single great innovation has built on the back of financial mania. Now the good news is, is we, the one thing we did accomplish, even though it had a negative return, is we put over a billion people on the internet. So virtually every brand that you can think of has a website. And all of us are completely and totally, uh, completely and totally dependent on the internet. And not to bring up another, this bad name for the second time during my speech, but I was introducing a guy at Stanford. Actually, it was Stanford Business School uh, back in uh, the end of 93. I'm a bad guy. Bush Stanford. <laughs> uh, I did go to UC Davis. <laughs> got a bond there. Uh, the, um, but I was introducing a guy at Stanford. His name is Jim Clark. Uh, this was at the end of... Uh, 1993, I had just started publishing uh, Red Herring, and he stood up and he goes, well, everybody, he goes, I have some bad news and I have some good news. Now, Jim Clark was already famous in our neighborhood because he founded a company called Silicon Graphics, which is a hardcore, bit-intensive computer, in, uh, engineering computer company that was already, already crazily successful. Well, back, uh, when Al Gore, if you remember, he invented the information superhighway. Remember that? 
Well, that had nothing to do with the internet, okay? That had to do with this idea that they, we were going to uh, uh, have a two-way cable system. So we all had our cable in our house, but the whole idea that Uncle Al and others had was we were going to have a two-way system so we could basically treat our cable system like the internet. Okay, so Jim Clark had been working. He stood up in front of Stanford Business School, and he said, hey, I've been working for four years with Time Warner Cable as my partner. Silicon Graphics wanted to create the set-top box that was going to give you that two-way interactivity. And he says, but I'm here to tell you, the bad news is, is after four years of trying to make this thing happen, I'm here to tell you that we can't get the set-top box, you know, underneath a thousand bucks. And as we all know with TiVos and everything else, I think the magic number is 200 bucks or 299. And he goes, so it ain't going to happen. So everybody's like, wow, okay. And he goes, but I have the good news is that three months ago, I met this 21-year-old kid out of the University of Illinois who's named Mark Andreessen. And, and in the last three months, he's taught me everything that I know about the internet. And did you know that there are two million people that are using the internet? And it was like, really? And, <laughs> and he said, so the good news is the information superhighway already exists. So I, you know, that was my aha moment because just three months earlier, I was interviewing Bill Gates uh, uh, and he, all he wanted to talk about was the information superhighway. And this was the one that was going to be the two-way cable. And he goes, and I go, yeah, but Bill, I mean, what are we going to do over this thing? And he goes, oh, order pizza. And, you know, he was just all excited. And I go, well, <laughs> I'm like, but, but how is this going to happen? He goes, finance, finance. And I go, well, if you wash your hair once in a while, Bill, maybe I'd believe you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so we won't go there. <clears throat> um, so, as back to my history training at Davis, uh, what I learned when I wrote The Internet Bubble is basically that the best time to actually start a, a new company uh, on, based upon a great new innovation is after the bubble bursts, okay? Because by that time, the cost of starting that company goes way down, okay? Because first of all, you had zero customers over here, zero people with internet experience, then you had a billion here. So that means you're not working hard to find people. You had rough technology with very few people who understood internet protocol uh, technology at that point and super expensive servers, blah, 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 over here. Here you have super cheap, millions of engineers that know, you know, been building stuff on the internet. And then you add the fact that a bunch of people got laid off and that opened up the uh, marketplace. Actually, when it felt like it was the worst time, that's when I believe, you know, Google, which was like the 13th or 14th uh, search engine company, uh, and everybody thought, you know, you got to be the first mover advantage. Well, they came in 14th, but now we've seen what they've done today. So they were kind of starting right at the perfect time. So since then, we've seen, you know, Skype, uh, YouTube, MySpace. Going on is a, a company, another company that I started, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. But, you know, again, uh, uh, it's, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur economically. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Now, if I leave any one thought uh, for you tonight to take away uh, from this little presentation, it has to do with this slide. Now, and that is, is um, the fact that for the first time since I've been traveling the streets of Silicon Valley, I've seen the first generational break since the PC generation, okay? So think about this. When I was a kid, uh, there is a coffee shop that I could hit with a baseball from my house called Conditori uh, in Portola Valley uh, near Palo Alto where the home brew computer club used to meet in 1974, okay? And at the home brew computer club was Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and a whole generation of geeks who literally were building personal computers by hand, okay? And they were not, they were uh, 
high on a lot of things, but also, <laughs> but they were, because down, just down the road was the Happy Hollow where Ken Kesey and the Electric Kool-Aid Asset Test guy, so we had a rocking street. Um, but in 74, they had this diluted mission, like, hey, I'm, we're going to put a computer on everybody's desk. Okay, and if you think about it, that was a really weird uh, idea. Okay, so, so if you were to zoom forward from 74, Apple starts in 78, Apple goes public in 1980, Microsoft goes public for 900 million in cap. Uh, see, I can talk that business school stuff. Uh, not market cap of 900 million. It was the only fourth largest personal, surface, personal computer software company at the time. But in my mind, that is, was the birth of the, of the PC generation who then, from about 86 on, drove the IT economy going forward, okay? And it was all based upon this religious belief that everybody's gonna want a computer someday, okay? So what about the IM generation? The IM, gen if, if the PC, gen if Bill Gates and Steve Jobs are 50, early, 51, 52 years old, which is amazing because they're the old men, right? Uh, by corporate uh, 500 standards, they'd be young CEOs, uh, but they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, if that is the center point of the PC generation in terms of age, I would argue that the center point in the IM generation is about, um, about 22, 23 years old. Okay, this is a generation that grew up with IM and looking at the web as a place to post and share and to connect with each other real time, okay? And I've been trying to kind of capsulize, because I have a 23-year-old daughter uh, who went on to uh, Cornell and got her computer science degree and a product management degree, a master's there, uh, which of course proves uh, that genes skip generations. Uh, but, <laughs> but she's a bright kid and she is a poster child for this generation. So I'm, you know, how do I quantify this? Well, I found this chart, which only tells a part of the story, but bottom line is, is that is that, that generation uses is email, or, or IM, and they, uh, more than they use email. And so it's a completely different behavior pattern. And that has driven, if I go, went back to the previous slide, the Skypes, the YouTubes, uh, the MySpaces, the Facebooks, uh, you know, a lot of the different applications in with, within Google, so that generation is now firmly in charge, and so what I would say to you as, uh, as aspiring entrepreneurs that whatever you do, if you don't put your idea on top of this generation, it won't succeed because they are now entering into the workforce and they are gonna take their behavior uh, and, and drive it in, into the real world. Uh, an interesting fact here which sends the Hollywood people that I talk to, crazy, is that 62% that the content that the average 21-year-old reads online was produced by somebody they know, okay? Um, which is shocking if you're a professional producer of content. Now, I predict a comeback of big media, uh, and I'm gonna show you a little demo on why, uh, but this is just a, an incredible generation that has a behavior pattern break with the rest of us who are part of the PC generation and above. Part of that phenomenon has obviously been the whole blogging movement. Uh, and what you can see is, is when I started Always On as a first kind of blog-oriented brand in the media world, uh, there's been an incredible uh, growth. But the thing about blogging is posting and sharing, okay? So to skip ahead, what happens when you look at history is that not only all those other economic conditions have to be right to be the perfect time to start a company on this new innovation, but um, you also uh, have to have uh, the, the right behavior in place, or you have to actually understand, okay, what was the real value here? So I would argue that Amazon.com, which I don't think has ever recorded over a 1% profit margin, that was like doing business the old way, okay? There was nothing really that interesting about e-commerce, okay? 
Um, what we've learned, or what I've learned in, in the post-bubble era, that the, that the two biggest things that we learned is that the power of the web, which is unique to this era, is that it has become this gigantic canvas where people can post and share content, whether it's video, photos, diaries, whatever they want, around the world instantly. Okay, the second behavior that, uh, that is truly unique uh, is the whole social networking side. So being seen and seeing each other and going places and discovering people that you didn't know before. Okay, so how many of you actively belong to a social network, just out of curiosity? Like Facebook, you know, check it out once in a while. Okay, put up racy photos of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's interesting. So it's a powerful thing, and, and my wife, who kind of sits in between uh, generations, she's 36, goes to her Facebook all the time and has reconnected with lots of people just in the last month. She discovered Facebook like a month ago. And she's going out to dinner every week with you know, old boyfriends, and I'm like, oh, and then, <laughs> uh, what's with this social networking? And now I go in and check her site. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would never do that. Um, the <laughs> Uh, as long as she doesn't check more, we have that. <laughs> <laughs> we we have that deal. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm getting off my on a tangent here. So the the point is is the social networking thing, and and that and these are really powerful ideas. And what's really interesting from a business school standpoint is if you look at the first generation of the internet companies, the what was the most financially successful. Uh, brand, internet brand that was founded in the 90s, financially. Does anybody have it? AOL? AOL? eBay. 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 Think about eBay. eBay was the first kind of social network, right? It was the first place where, you, where they made it easy for you to post and share. So you go, you post pictures of your old jeans, you know, you, <laughs> um, you, you, then you build a community around your old jeans. And then you sell them to the highest fool. Um, <laughs> and you get better than retail. Um, so it's no, I think they, it was just amazing that they kind of found, figured that out in the first generation. And they have been rewarded for that. Um, okay, I'm going to, I've been rambling, so I'm going to kind of move through these. So it's a whole other favorite story of mine, but or favorite subject of mine. But I think what's interesting is because of openness, basically the analogy is is back at the birth of the PC industry, you had a bunch of computer companies, right? And they were building computers for engineers, and most of them said, "Oh, a non-engineer is never going to want a PC," so they completely didn't sign on to the PC generation. And you know what? Well, you can list those companies. They're all out of business, okay? DAC, uh, Apollo, Prime. I mean, these are ones that you've never even heard of. They're so out of business, okay? Uh, the second uh, group, like IBM and HP, they embraced the PC, and they're still here today. And then that generation also gave birth to the Dells and the Microsofts and the Apples and, and, and ones that just get, were born out of that generation. So I think that's the same way it's going to be with the media business. The media businesses that don't allow you to go and post and share on their sites, the media companies that don't allow you to see who else is coming to their networks, uh, they're going to they're, they're gonna fall behind and people are not going to trust them, the new generation. Uh, and I think it's interesting that Rupert Murdoch so this is going to create a whole opportunity for a bunch of niche, smaller media networks. Okay, and I'm happy to talk about that more, uh, but I think that's really exciting. So we are now in the open media revolution, and what I've been saying since 2002 is that, you know, join the open re revolution or die. This is impacting the workforce, and the workforce is becoming completely virtualized. Okay, so as managers, we have to have a lot more trust in people, and we use, and, and as I said, as my daughter's generation moves into the workforce, they're going to have, you know, they're going to demand social networking, they're going to primarily communicate with uh, uh, each other through I am, you know, they're going to be working, you know, not between nine and five, but whenever they're in front of their device, 
they're largely, in my opinion, I think, and I was um, back in May, uh, I was at a, uh, with Steve Jobs at a, a conference uh, a little, almost a year ago, and it, and it was just before he was announcing the iPhone, and he says, well, you know, Tony, it's a revolutionary device. And as an editor, when anybody says, oh, I'm a, I've got a revolutionary device, you got your red flags start flying all over the place. And you're like, okay, Steve, right on. And, uh, <laughs> and now that I'm a user, if I look at my own behavior on this phone, 95% of the time that I use this, I'm out on the web. Okay, he's, he's made it very easy for me because with one, you know, flick of my, you know, thumb, I can see weather, I can see the stock market, I can see all sorts of stuff, I get my, but it's all coming over the web. So to think that 95% of the time I use a phone, I'm not using it, I'm not dealing with my carrier, I'm dealing with the internet, and then it's Wi-Fi enabled, uh, is an amazing thing. Now I have a four-year-old daughter, who I have a lovely picture of, that would be in my slide if I hadn't put my backpack on the back of my car and drove off with it and never, could found it again, uh, shows you that, you know, I'm scattered. Um, but, <laughs> but the point is, is, is she wakes up in the morning because my wife, who I call hippie chic, she owns her own yoga studio, uh, doesn't allow us to watch television at our house. And so we are television service deprived. So my daughter, who's four, wakes up in the morning and goes, iPhone, right? So she comes, if you look at my YouTube bookmarks on my iPhone, it's Mary Poppins, <laughs> Uh, Beyonce, which makes me very nervous, uh, you know, a couple things, okay, but they're all hers, you know, Yellow Brick Road, and this is her television set. So it's very clear to me that in very short order, because now we're all, everybody wants to have all the, everybody's got Apple Envy, so Sprint's coming out with theirs, everybody's going to come out with a cool one, and the video experience on it is so powerful and beautiful that I predict the IM generation primarily we're going to be using a phone like this to do most of their computing, which is opening up a whole new platform. I'm not going to bore you with corporate blogging. Um, but, uh, but this is becoming a, this and other devices like this will become a brand new platform, okay? And all new platforms are based on the internet. You know, the PC generation grew up with uh, the Wintel dominance. So Intel and, and Microsoft owned the platform and closed everybody out, and there was a lot of stifling of innovation during that period of time, but now no one owns you know, internet protocols, no one owns the internet, the phone companies no longer own their phones, uh, the web does, and so it's just opening up a, a whole new world of innovation. So a lot of our conferences like On Media in New York, our own Hollywood conference coming up in June. We're talking about where entertainment is going. Uh, it's all, all now about how to entertain the mobile uh, viewer, how to monetize mobile entertainment, all these kind of things. Um, how are we going to fund this? Why are we not in a bubble? You know, what's going to support this? Well, here's a statistic: thirty percent, roughly, of the of our time consuming media is now on the internet, okay? 6.8% uh, is of the advertising dollars are being spent on the internet. So there's a gap, 30% of the eyeballs, only 6.8% of the dollars. So what's gonna fund all this innovation largely is gonna be advertising revenue and it's gonna be bridging that gap to where the eyeballs are. The only thing that's necessary is that we gotta figure out how to creatively touch those eyeballs. Um, now, I want to open up for questions, but I do want to see if I can get on the internet. How many of you, uh, just for fun, how many of you watch um, any kind of internet uh, on, their t on their television sets? Okay, not many, which is very normal. Um, how many people watch long form uh, content uh, on the on their uh, computers. Wow, that's pretty cool. How many people have ever watched uh, a show on ABC? Um, ABC.com. 
Okay, like desperate housewives. Okay, let me try to get the, let me see if I can make this happen. Okay, so there was a company, here's the statistic. During the YouTube generation, uh, during the YouTube generation, the average viewing time of a video was 2.7 minutes. So everybody that was in the media business said, oh, we, you know, we can, we can't do a, if we're going to do video over the internet, it can't be done, you know, it can't be over three minutes. Okay, well, uh, if I can make this work, um, the, I think what I'm doing wrong, I always fail. Um, try to get one of these to work. Uh, <laughs> well, what I'm going to show you is basically the reason that it was, as it turns out, the reason that The it following was, episode is presented. Uh, 2.7 2 minutes is because the quality, the YouTube type experience is good if you want to see, you heard that Hillary Clinton was crying and you want to go see her cry, or <laughs> David Letterman, you know, gave Paris Hilton a lot of grief or whatever, and you go, oh, I miss that. So you go on a YouTube and it's not necessarily the best experience, uh, but you, um, uh, but you tolerate it anyway. Um, now this is part of the problem. It takes you a million clicks uh, to do this. But what happened? What's happened is there's this company which we've written about. We discovered about three years ago called Move Networks that has created um, a. Uh, they've created a way to deliver. Um, content in a high definition broadband uh, quality way, uh, which I want to show you and it's not working for me. Um, and their average viewing time now is, um, geez, uh, their average viewing time is, maybe I'm still watching commercials here, uh, their average viewing time is now over 70 minutes, okay? So what I'm saying to you is that uh, big, big, TV, uh, or, or the reason we haven't been watching television content over the internet is because we haven't had the, the quality of experience. And I'm just on a regular uh, internet connection here. Um, I don't know why I can't bring this to full screen. It's just not wanting to do it. Goodness, so what is this thing you have? Retro what? You know, I think you're getting the Retro point that this is much show. higher yeah, quality you than the YouTube experience. And if you can deliver you this, which this move <gasps> networks will allow <gasps> any television network to do <laughs> this, then people the will watch, and she's uh, getting they'll back. watch Desperate Housewives, Ladies they'll watch uh, great, you know, any t regular television uh, content. Uh, so I predict that that mind share that the kids have been moving away from content are going to move back, but they're going to watch that content over internet-enabled television sets. And if you don't think that Steve Jobs is not working on a sweet new flat-screen TV, then, you know, you heard it here first. Uh, the, 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 and, and, and take over the Apple or the TV market. Uh, but again, a lot of it will come over the uh, mobile device. So when you add all of these things up, and the fact that all of these behavior patterns are going to be demanded by the IM generation in the corporate world, which is going to put a whole new demand on a whole bunch of new cool services and, and really push all the enterprise out on the web uh, in real time, uh, that is why it's the greatest time to be an entrepreneur. So with that, I really want to see if you all have any questions on your mind about anything, politics, uh, what it was like being in Davis in the late 70s, uh, whatever. So with that, I'll end my formal talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, the question is: uh, there was a there was an article, uh, I think, a few months back, that uh, in the next five years you will have so much content that internet might break. Ah. Okay. So how are we going to fund that next? generation of internet itself, the engineering behind it, the bandwidth, uh, you know, the whole servers, the architecture, and how the media will play, what kind of role the media will play. Is it going to be an agent of change, or how is it going to play the big role in the next level of internet? Okay, first of all, uh, uh, along with never taking a business class, I've never taken a computer science class, uh, so I don't know how we're going to solve the infrastructure problem that will eventually occur, but what I do know uh, is that some entrepreneurs are already working on it, and I'm not worried about it. 
you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, solutions that are being bantering around. Um, at the end of the day, you know, content is king. You know, we, um, you know, it well produced. I think that's why. I mean, whether it's you know, Ugly Betty or Office or whatever, this is proven content. So this is giving the people that know how to produce content that can keep your attention for an hour the opportunity to reach the generation that frankly doesn't like their television set. They don't like the television set because they can't do anything with it. Okay, they can't IM. They can't do their homework. They, they you know, this generation, it's friggin' bizarre. If you ever sit behind these kids and watch them operate in a computer, it's scary. I mean, maybe some of you are scary. I'm not scary, <laughs> and it's scary when I see it. So they, they are the command and control generation, okay? But if you can put this quality experience in front of them on their, you know, while they're sitting around waiting, you know, for the bus on their iPhone, or they can have it in their room while they're doing the 10 other things, or they're, they're going to watch it. So. You know, the good news is, is great content is going to continue to drive, and I think it's the same kind of content uh, that we've seen historically, uh, and, and that's unfortunate in some respects. Uh, in terms of what happened during the IM kind of uh, open media part, I think the reason that uh, uh, kids, the, I think the big mistake that it, uh, Hollywood didn't figure out is that kids like to watch each other's videos. They like to go to each other's MySpace profiles. They like to look what their friends are doing because it's very personal to them. And I think that is a dimension that's always going to exist. So if I'm a media company, I'm saying, okay, let me give them a mix. I'm going to give them the ugly Bettys, but I'm going to allow them to come into under our brand and play. And, and that is really goes against the culture of the media business because the media business wants to control everything underneath their brand. But if you go to USA Today and others, they're, they're opening themselves up. Was there a question over here? So I, my name is Shankar. I'm a second year uh, student. And my question is very specific with respect to the social networking sites. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, and the question is really about, you know, the business model that they are trying to adopt. And it appears that there's a plethora of you know social networking sites that are available out there, but you know there's really the question of you know where they, they do generate the revenue, right? Because we see that Facebook, for example, is valued at about you know fifteen billion dollars, mm -hmm. but it still appears that you know the number of advertisers who come and post their you know advertisements, you know on this on these type of websites is is really not that great. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would like to hear about your opinions regarding uh, you know social networking sites as a good uh, you know business model. Or a viable business model. Sure. Well, I think uh, an important point I would like to make tonight, which is not necessarily conventional wisdom, which is I think the social networking boom has just begun. You know, there are more conventionally you go, oh, Facebook owns it or whatever. I don't believe that at all. And particularly when you look at virtual reality communities like Gaia and Penguin and, and some of these new emerging uh, virtual reality communities, Second Life, I mean, there was this very perverse. Wall Street article about this guy who wakes up and he smokes cigarettes and he's he's like lives in Second Life and he motorcycles around with his you know dashing redhead and in Second Life he's all muscular and you know and his wife comes in and gives him a beer and you know he's making love with a cartoon and it gets really ugly. But the point <laughs> being is that people are immersing themselves and, and the level in which people are going to immerse themselves socially out on the internet is, is just like, it, it's just going to keep going. Okay, so don't be discouraged if you have a social networking idea. There's going to be plenty of opportunities. You know, over time they'll all figure out how to work together. In terms of monetiz monetization, if you can get people's attention and you can define who those people are, then you're going to be able to monetize, okay? So that's the one thing that will never change in the media business is content or services lead to an audience, and if that audience is an attractive audience, you're going to be able to monetize it, okay? Where you get in trouble is where you have a zillion people come to your site, but they're very scattered and low demographic and one-time hits and all that kind of stuff. It gets more and more difficult. But th I think out on the long tail, there's a bunch of affinity social networking opportunities around really cool, high demographic type of interests uh, that are that are there, ready to be picked off. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, my question is about the device where all the content is actually getting delivered. Um, there is the TV, and then there is the PC screen, and then there is the mobile phone. 
And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on whether that's going to be one screen per person or is it going to be a bunch of screens? So you go home and there'd be your 46 inch monitor, there'd mm -hmm. be a computer monitor and you'd have your phone or is it all going to go into one actual device and not a bunch of them? Yeah, <coughs> I mean, I, I kind of see there's three basic devices. There's the big screen experience, okay, and uh, again, that is going to be more and more integrated uh, with the internet. So you're going to watch more and more internet content uh, over your big screen, and you're going to watch it over there for the big screen experience, okay? And, and you're going to be happy because you're going to be able to do other things during commercials or whatever. Uh, the iPhone is your entertainment on the run, okay? So you can be in the airport and watch a basketball game and other things. Uh, and then I think your computer allows, is the, mo is the most uh, interactive and easy to you know, do longer stuff. Although these kids are getting really good on their mobile devices, uh, searching and keying words and text messaging and all that. So that's why I believe the new generation will leave their laptops behind and primarily be iPhone type people. And then you'll be able to see more and more uh, broadcast quality, longer play stuff over the internet and you'll be able to see that on demand, and so you'll choose that. You didn't TiVo it or whatever, so you'll go home and you'll just throw it on to your big screen and get that experience. And you won't really care in the end whether where that how that content is being piped to you, because as ABC has proven, that since they give a non-buffering, high-definition broadcast quality experience, people just treat it exactly like it's they're watching TV, and they'll hang out. They're not watching YouTube because it's buffering. The technology isn't as good uh, as, uh, as what's coming out now. So. Thank you, Tony. Right. These, <laughs> this generation has to go back to class. <laughs> oh, good. Wait, don't go away. We have a little something oh, good, for good. you when you're on the run, I'm on the go. He's always on. <laughs> Th thanks so much. Thank you.